Hi everyone, hi and welcome back to Professional Beauty Group's Upskill series. I'm Eve Oxbury, I'm editor of Professional Beauty and our live session today is Understanding Melasma, Treatment and Control for Clients. So today, as you can see, I'm joined by Jodie Taylor, who is the owner of Skin Deep Clinic and the Skin Deep Professional Academy in Doncaster, where she focuses on advanced treatments for skin health. Um, and Jodie is also the winner of Professional Beauty's Therapist of the Year in 2017. So hi Jodie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me back. I'm really looking forward to this today. Excellent. Um, yeah, new news yesterday, so it should be good. Absolutely, yeah, we were. We were just saying before we went live, weren't we, that I think uh, even though we've got a bit of a wait for reopening, it's just such a relief to have a roadmap and a, and a, and a date in sight. So yeah, I think there's a bit more of a positive mood today, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. So Jodie's going to be doing a presentation in just a sec, but if you've got any questions as we go along, if you're watching with us here in the webinar platform, just type them either in the um, chat box or the Q&A that you can see at the bottom of your screen, or you should be able to. Um, and if you're watching on Facebook, then type them in the comments and they'll get through to us and we will answer them live. But do type them as we go along so we've got questions ready when Jodie's done. But um, for now, I'm going to turn off my camera and let you share your screen then, Jodie. Thank you, Eve. Let's do get to the right one. Can everybody see that okay? Can you see that okay, Eve? Yeah, that's looking great. Fab. Um, right, okay, so I will start. So today we're going to look at melasma, which is dermal pigmentation. When I started to write this out for um, professional beauty, I was going to do it on pigmentation in general. But with the time we've got today, the subject's so large, I thought we'd do it on melasma because this is a condition that I find people struggle with the most with treating and understanding and we've only got a good 25 minutes today so I'm going to go through quickly and get as much information across as possible. The 10th content we're going to cover today is what is melasma, who gets melasma, the causes of melasma, Consultation techniques to help determine if it's hyperpigmentation, which is epidermal pigmentation or dermal pigmentation known as melasma, and the dietary factors, topical ingredients and treatment options suitable for treating melasma clients. Dermal pigmentation, here you can see a image of one of my clients who has quite a mild case of melasma and we're on a control with this and this she comes in regular and we maintain this. So this form of facial pigmentation was previously called cloasma. If you're at college when I was, that's what it was always known as. This derives from the Greek meaning to become green. The term melasma brown skin is now preferred and that comes from another Greek word melas meaning black. On the right, we can see an image of a woods lamp and this is showing hyperpigmentation. The differences with dermal pigmentation is that the melanin has fallen into the dermis and is processed by the melanophages, which is the men melanin containing macrophage. It's a blue gray color, whereas hyperpigmentation is a tan speckled effect. The blue gray color is known as the Tyndall effect. Melasma is in a block appearance, a solid block appearance, whereas hyperpigmentation is more mottled and speckled across all the skin. Under a woods lamp, melasma will be unchanged. Here we can see un with hyperpigmentation under the woods lamp, it's completely enhanced. And you can see all that epidermal pigmentation, which is not actually visible to the naked eye. So a woods lamp is an excellent tool, diagnostic tool to use within consultations. You can also use dermoscopes, which is more medical, to show a visible irregular network of the melasma. There are distinct melasma patterns. So melasma can be separated into epidermal, dermal and mixed types, depending on the level of increased melanin within the skin. Epidermal pigmentation is a lot easier to treat than a dermal pigmentation. And dermal pigmentation cannot be cured as such, but it will always need to be maintained. The distinct patterns of melasma. 
there's what the main one 50 to 80 percent of people is centrofacial and that's the one which we know is the butterfly effect there's mala which checks the cheeks and the nose mandibular affecting the jawline and the chin there's erythosis pigmentosa facie, which is reddened or inflamed vascular melasma, which gives it a uh, like a browny red tinge. And extra facial, where people have it maybe on the backs or per, upper arms and shoulders. So they're the distinct melasma patterns that you can see. The people that get melasma, it's more common in women than men. And the age is between 20 and 40 years for the onset. It is most common in Fitzpatrick types three to four. And melasma predominantly occurs in people with skin of color and 90% of those are women, Latin American, Asian, Middle Eastern and North Africa. These are the areas with a higher prevalence of melasma. There's a lot of studies that have been done in countries such as Brazil, where they have a, a lot of um, women who do suffer with this skin condition. We'll look at the causes of melasma and the triggers. The main triggers are genetics, UV, UVA and UVB, the age of the client, the gender, hormones. We'll look at hormones in more detail, medication, and researchers are examining the role of stem cell, neural, vascular, and local hormonal factors in promoting melanocyte activation. We will now look at the more of the theory of how this epidermal pigmentation is becoming dermal pigmentation and why the two differ. We need to look at the dermal epidermal junction. And the last time I did this, I went through the dermal epidermal junction for more of a collagen response with micro needling. So the dermal epidermal junction functions are to have epidermal and dermal adherence to give mechanical and structural support for the epidermis and to help the efficiency of the epidermis. It's also a barrier to the exchange of cells um, to and molecules to the junction. This is a diagram which shows on the left and under a microscope and you can see that road map or river going through the middle of that um, cross section there and above is the epidermis and below is the dermis. That road map um, river running through is the dermal epidermal junction. So it's quite a small area, but it is really significant. If we look on the right hand side, we can see the cross section showing the epidermal area above and the dermal below. We're gonna concentrate on the green band and the yellow area. So the lamina densa is composed of type four collagen anchoring fibrils made of type seven collagen and dermal microfibrils making the lamina densa of dermal origin. An intact basement membrane at the epidermal junction is essential to help with the stability of the skin. The melanosomes accumulate here in the lamina lucidia, which as you can see is of epidermal tissue. If this dermal epidermal junction becomes compromised, those melanocytes start to escape through the green lamina densa um, at the bottom. These are distributed by protices, making the pigment become part of papillary dermis. So this is the area where that pigmentation that's contained within those melanocytes starts to protrude and push down and then becomes a dermal issue. Now, one of the mediators that we need to look at is the mast cell, and this is significant. So these are, we know about with wound healing. These are a resident um, inf inflammatory cell of the skin, and these are highly important. The main function is to have a histamine response, respond to tissue injury, releasing those inflammatory mediators, and they do participate in all three stages of wound healing. And they have an inflammatory reaction and angiogenesis, and they do help with extracellular matrix reabsorption. 
So inflammation is likely to play a large role in sun exposed skin, considering that the UV stimulated inflammatory signals, including cytokines and the peptide alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, known as AMSH, can also trigger melanogenesis. So we're going to look at the mast cell and its response from UV and how this is stimulating and causing a melanin, um, the melanin to become of dermal origin, whilst considering the dermal epidermal junction's role in melasma formation. We're going to just look at this slide now. So at the top, you can see the UV rays coming down and that mast cell that is released through inflammation. So the heat from the UV rays will start to release a histamine response. So if you consider some people who get prickly heat, this is the mast cell working. And what this histamine response does, it starts to trigger epidermal pigmentation. So the amount of melanin is significantly increased in all of those epidermal layers. It also starts to release tryptase. And what that does is then it starts to upregulate the elastin, the MMPs and granzyme, which causes what we know in the extracellular matrix, it causes a degradation, which is known as solar elastosis. And that's the um, thing that you see in old people that have had a lot of sun damage. It can be yellow. It causes a, a cross section of webbing of wrinkles uh, where they've got a total collagen degradation. Um, so this sort of basal uh, membrane disposition starts to cause on the surface of the skin, it causes a degradation of the collagen with, within the dermal epidermal junction and the dermis. So UV damage is causing a issue with pigment and it's causing an issue with collagen. So this is giving you two factors to play with age management and the possibility of increased risk of melasma. It also affects the growth factors. So the basement membrane is disrupted at this point and thinned, facilitating that migration of those melanocytes and melanin into the dermis. These protruding melanocytes are a big characteristic of melasma. Solar elastosis is prominent and the number of mast cells is significantly increased within this dermis. And the number of blood vessels are greater in melasma. And if we consider the... Uh, growth factors and the vascularization that takes us back to the melasma which has uh, more redness um, and gives it that sort of ready tone and, and telangiectasia across the cheeks. So the functionality and skin pigmentation are regulated by the active role of the extracellular matrix proteins and fibroblasts of the dermis. The expression of the MMPs is increased to chronic UV exposure, and the upmodulation is possibly responsible for the dysfunction of the basement membrane within the dermal epidermal junction. The MMPs will start to then degrade that collagen type 4 and type 7 that's within the extracellular matrix, uh, the uh, dermal epidermal junction. So this causes like an excess of activity between the dermal and epidermal interactions of these melanocytes, leaving this, melan uh, this melanin free to go into the dermis. It also causes an elevation of level of cytokines. Cytokines you'll know from wound healing, and these proteins are involved in uh, all phases of uh, cell signaling. They are produced by the mast cell. And they, um, are a, they host an immune response, for example, inflammation, which we are seeing once there is UV damage. So these elevated up uh, levels of the cytokines start to affect the vascularization and have been demonstrated in melasma skin, such as the vascular endothelial growth factors and the stem cell growth factors. So your mast cell is an important regulator of the development of not only photoaging, hyperpigmentation and melasma. So the mast cell tryptase has been shown to promote solar elastosis, inducing the protein, uh, in, 
sorry, inducing the production of elastin and in fibroblasts within the dermis. So that degradation is why you start to get that cross section on the skin. And it's hard to improve once they've had that much collagen degradation. And it gives them that browny, yellowy, patchy tone and will lead to age spots as well. So considering all the degradation that you have got and how the epidermal pigmentation has started to protrude into the dermis, we'll have a look at some consultation techniques of how to determine, has my client got epidermal pigmentation? Has my client got dermal pigmentation? Is it mixed? Can I treat it? How will I be able to do that? So if we go on to the consultation, one of the big classification systems that we use is the Fitzpatrick scale. And this is widely used, especially for hair removal treatments using IPL and laser. So the Fitzpatrick scale is, as I say, is widely used and it was developed in 1975 by Thomas Fitzpatrick. This just shows the different skin types and how the skin will be affected through UV rays. And other than that, it doesn't consider anything else. So you can see that a skin type one will generally burn and never have a tan, whereas a dark brown skin will normally not burn. Now, another one I like to, and I always say this wrong, the Glaugo classification system. I like to use this. It's not particularly used for um, UV as such. This was developed in 1994 by Richard Glogo uh, to elevate the effects of sun damage on a Caucasian skin. So this diagram is limiting. It was developed to objectively measure the severity of wrinkles and photo damage. So this is gonna help you as a practitioner pick the most appropriate procedures for the treatment, considering the wrinkle depth and the UV damage whilst also keeping in mind their Fitzpatrick colouring. Another one I like to use and to consider, and this one's a great one, so this one does not just consider the individual, it's, com it's considering the genetics and the, of that client. So it's determined by adding all four of the grandparents' ethnicities. You'll divide the total by four to achieve a risk factor rating. The higher they are on the Lancer scale, there will be more at risk of pigmentary issues, especially after treatments such as chemical peeling and laser treatments. So these three diagrams are a useful tool to start and help you build a picture of what treatments you're going to provide. And another one is the melasma um, skin severity. So from here, you can see, have they got any hyperpigmentation? No. Okay, so you're not doing anything with hyperpigmentation for this treatment. But as they move up, you can see how much of an issue it is and how they go through the severity index is going to be, they're going to have more of an issue um, and want this treated. So whilst you've got all these four different scales and classification systems to combine, this will give you a better plan as a practitioner and the tools to determine those possible risk factors for treatments, considering post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the skin age and the inflammatory response, as I've we've just covered, that's quite, the inflammatory response is really important. So each system has its benefits and its limitations. So before you, as the practitioner, like provides or proposes any form of treatment, the client phototype must always be considered due to the amount of melanin in the skin. So for example, if you're gonna carry out laser and light treatments, the light emitted from the laser and impulse light will be attracted to any melanin and could be too close to the surface of the skin. But we've just discussed that melasma doesn't like heat and it's quite an inflammatory condition. So would such a heat treatment especially IPL, would, would that be the best uh, treatment for melasma? No, but it is good for epidermal. So you would need to consider the wound healing response when you're also carrying out treatments such as chemical peeling and microneedling. Okay, so we'll move on to topical ingredients. And the one thing we hear about all the time is tyrosinase inhibitors. So I'm not gonna go through 
each tyrosinase inhibitor ingredient because there are so, so many. But I do think we need to cover what is tyrosine and why it is important to use with clients of a higher skin Fitzpatrick and those that have hyperpigmentation and dermal pigmentation issues. So it is an enzyme that's located in melanocytes and these are specialized cells that produce a pigment called melanin. Melanogenesis is conducted in melanocytes and it is located in the basal layer of the epidermis and controlled by tyrosinase. Tyrosinase inhibitors are used because of their ability to suppress that melanin production. So if we can suppress it, you'll not get any more coming through. And it is a copper containing enzyme that promotes the oxidation of phenols such as tyrosine. Now, when you have the UV rays come down, this enzyme is released from the DNA um, damage and it starts to stimulate for melanin to be produced. Now, once the melanin starts to be produced, these melan melanin starts to uh, build up within the melanosome, these little like, organelles within the melanocyte. And a melanocyte has like dendritic arms, long arms. And these, this melanin builds up, builds up within the melanosome, works up the dendritic arm of the melanocyte cell, which we know is epidermal in that basal layer. So it, it docks at the side of a keratinocyte and it literally unloads and spills its contents in there to start to get a tan. So it's important that we inhibit this process of this enzyme so that they don't get any more pigmentation. So retinol, that's a big one we talk about all the time and there's many, many forms and some retinoids are very, very irritating on the skin depending on their um, like their cosmetic index of how they will work. And some retinoids are great and some are not the best to use if they're gonna to cause too much inflammation. But again, it does inhibit tyrosine. Niacinamide is, I'm just gonna whiz over these, is uh, vitamin B3. I love this ingredient. It's great not only for calming pigmentation, inhibiting that transfer, inhibiting the whole process. So it's stopping that transfer happening. It will also disrupt how everything um, works and reduces any coloring in the skin. So it's a great ingredient, but it's really nice to use on rosacea and acne clients as well. Vitamin C, again, it's a great product, powerhouse ingredient, has many, ben many benefits. So you've got a more mature client that's got lots of cellular elastoses, got degradation, and is starting to get um, wrinkles that are not just expression wrinkles. High vitamin C, use retinoids, is a great option. You go into up the fibroblast stimulation to produce more collagen, and you're going to stop the uh, melanin synthesis. And it's great because it's a free radical inhibitor. So it'll stop that DNA degradation of those cells. Kojic acid is a great one to use alongside clients with acne because it has a slow binding inhibition of tyrosinase activity. It gives that whitening effect. So it's great on people that have had papules and pustules and they've left the mark and they look like they have spots for a long time afterwards, but the spots have cleared, but there's post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation there. And kojic acid is really good for helping in the sebaceous unit. So it is a pigment regulator and it's a potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. So again, that's great for clients with rosacea and clients that have acne and have a lot of inflammation. We need to calm the inflammatory response to reduce the risk of post-inflammatory pigmentation the melasma that's been quite dormant, flushing up, so it's more visible on the surface of the skin, and so they get less breakouts. So tyrosine inhibitors, now we know exactly what they are. We need to know why we're going to give the client these pre-treatment, and for how long before we need to give them these um, ingredients. So considering the classification systems and what skin type clients got, what their genetics are, what their age is, what their skin is like, have they got wrinkles in motion or not, you're going to give them home care two to four weeks prior before you do any form of treatment. And this is not 
only relevant for melasma, but for other clinical indications. So when you're treating melasma, remember it's very prickly to heat inflammation and it can just flush up the surface of the skin. So we need to kind of tone it down, use the tyrosinase inhibitors to calm it down. So a Caucasian skin fits Patrick one and two, maybe two weeks at a very, very minimum. Anybody who's dark of the skin type, the more uh, preparation and pre-treatment they will need. So you're going to aim for four weeks. You need to ex be able to fully explain to the client, this is how your pigmentation is, is a, a melasma, a dermal pigmentation, and it needs to be calmed down before we start a treatment, which is going to create a wound, which is going to create inflammation. And I need to know, I'm not going to have you suffering with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Now, in the past, I have been sent pictures from uh, people, Jodie, what do I do with this? They've gone, the, the skin's gone black. They look like they've been colored in with Sharpie pens because they've just got, yeah, yeah get on the couch, yeah, we're going to do your treatment. And the body has reacted and it's brought all that inflammation and that pigment up and then you've got a big issue so if you're using retinoids that are going to cause a speed up and an extracellular renewal you're going to have to ask them to stop that treatment three days before five days before depending on the client's actual skin type barrier function how their skin's working how in, um, how much of an inflammatory response the skin has Ask them to stop before you do your in-clinic treatment. If they're using glycolic acids to help the efficiency of kojic acids, for example, maybe 48 hours would be enough, but you would need to determine how long to stop the ingredients they're using, what ones to use between those three days before they start treatment. You're also gonna to start to smooth out and help the barrier function of the skin. And this can help not only increase the efficiency of those products, but give it an even penetration, especially if you're doing peeling or peeling with other combination treatments. Topical retinoids will help speed up peeling and reduce telangiectasias. So if you have a client that has redness in their melasma, has that extra vascularity, maybe retinoids is gonna be a better choice than kojic acid, for example. And you are using these to reduce the possibility of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. If you have a client who's in that severity index at that top end with maybe 60% melasma across their skin, they're not gonna want you to do a treatment to create more. So if they've come in, they've done the treatment you've decided, and then you need to look at what you're gonna do afterwards. And basically you're gonna carry on whatever you've done before, during and after with your home care. You might make slight adjustments to the ingredients dependent on how the client's skin's presenting. They do need to use a broad spectrum sunscreen and they do need to use on a daily basis. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, you can use cleansing products which may include glycolic acids, continue their use, continue all your topical ingredients to not only reduce the pigment but to support the healing of the treatments you're doing. We talked about the triggers earlier, so we need to have a quick review now of hormones. Um, and we do need to, I just thought I'd put this on, I'm just gonna read this off there about the melanin stimulating hormone. So this is your peptide, your pituitary gland releases it and it activates melanogenesis. It's responsible for producing human growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, sex, mood, pain relief, stress, metabolism hormones. Any factor that affects these may indirectly or directly affect MSH produced production, leading to subsequent melasma. So your hormones are the chemical messengers which is carried in the blood. So if you have vascularity, from the sun and you've got an increase of inflammation, the blood will carry these hormones, but other things can help um, stimulate hormone release. So estrogen, these elevated levels of estrogen and to a let, lesser extent progesterone levels are increased uh, with pigmentation. 
and you you will fluctuate your estrogen levels um, in pregnancy and menopause when your clients start on the contraceptive pill you'll see when you start on the contraceptive pill they kind of get like a brown mouth sometimes i've had that a lot with um younger girls hrt can start to produce more pigment especially age spots so this elevation stimulates melanocyte activity indirectly and directly to produce more pigment cortisol so as you're stressed which people have been for a good year now during the times when our body is stressed you have an increase of cortisol and that increase stimulates estrogen so not only is it going to start to upregulate your um, msh levels increasing that melanin production Client's going to feel more stressed. It can actually uh, induce weight gain, but that's a different story. So, would you want to start to promote some more well being treatments and relaxing treatments to try and help the client in between maybe your other treatments to improve mindfulness? Just bearing in mind what they may be going through as to why these estrogen levels are increased, especially at the time of menopause. Um, clients can really suffer um, with, mentally with that. And that is due to all the increases and decreases. Dietary factors. I'd always want to treat my client inside out and I'd like to look at their diet and what they could maybe include or exclude from their diet to help with the condition melasma. I do it with all things, but we'll just look at melasma. So things to include, you want to keep the inflammation down, you want to up the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and the foods to help you do that is omega-3, 6, 9, fish oils, green tea, berries, lots of berries, antioxidants in berries. If you know your ingredients, you'll notice that you have like mulberry, uh, bearberry, uh, gallic acid, malic acids. They're used in your ingredients as tyrosinase inhibitors, and they do help if you eat them as well. Your vegetables such as broccoli, mushrooms, and grapes. Um, Sometimes you could give clients a supplement, especially in omega fatty acids. They will not only help with uh, melanin, uh, melasma, uh, melanin production, they will also help, especially if the client's got a real dry skin, it will help that client. So as clients start to age, that's a good ingredient to include. There are foods with a high estrogen content. And unfortunately, it's just, if people have a vegan diet, they can really suffer with this because it's eliminating a lot of the food that they eat, which is dry fruit, chickpeas, tofu, and soy, and also multigrain breads are high in estrogen content. So that's something to discuss when you discuss your lifestyle factors with um, your clients. So treatment, you've got all that info, you took all that information from your client, you've done a great skin analysis, you've touched the skin, felt the skin, had them under a mag lamp, had them under a woods light, decided this is what um, we're looking at doing. So you're gonna consider how it's been caused, how long it's been there, their genetics, uh, their inflammatory response they could get. Always considering you can't cure it, so you're gonna need to maintain it. So this is something that you'd want to um, maybe package up with the client and tell them exactly what you're gonna be doing, sort of a plan, an overview, for the rest of time of how you're going to maintain the melasma, explain to them which ingredients work best. And studies have shown that topical ingredients work best for curing and maintaining melasma, but you can use other um, treatments as well. So always consider with melasma, the increase of inflammation and heat is a stimulator, which creates the inflammatory response Wound healing requires an inflammatory response to put, release the cells like cytokines to improve, but the inflammation doesn't want to stay in the area. So this is the same with a melasma skin. So you must, must be careful on the treatments that you are um, choosing and the tortoise always wins the race. SPF sunblock, they do need, they need a good home care routine and you can do many different treatments such as needling. You do need to get a pinpoint bleed when you're doing melasma treatments because you kind of want the products in the area where the pigmentation is. There's no point in needling epidermally when you've got a dermal issue and that will help if, if they're aging as well. Peeling, maybe um, you might want a stronger peel to, do, to treat this condition 
and they will need pre-care and aftercare. Um, retinoids can help as well. And always speak to your client about their expectations um, that they must understand. I can't say this enough. This is not curable. Um, so that is something that you would all always need to cover. I hope I've covered everything there. I feel like I've gone really quickly, but it's quite a big subject. Um, I'm sorry I didn't, couldn't go through each individual um, ingredient of tyrosinase inhibitors. There's loads. I mean, licorice is a lovely one, but um, I couldn't go through them all. I'm just going to hand back to Eve and see if you guys have got any questions for me, and hopefully I can answer them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jodie. That was really, really good. Um, do you want to just stop sharing your screen and people can see us uh, nice and big again? Yes. Fab. Um, we have had a few questions pop through already. If anyone else has any questions for Jodie, now's the time to get them in. So type them in the chat box here in Zoom if you're in the webinar with us or in the Facebook chat. Um, but yeah, we have had a, a few already. Um, Marina has asked, what AHA would you recommend is best to treat melasma? Then have a look at the skin. So if somebody's really dry and dehydrated, glycolic acid is not going to be the friend, but lactic acid is really good. It's a great hydrator. Um, somebody who's maybe more mature and has got a lot of um, hyperpigmentation as well as melasma, maybe combine glycolic acid with kojic acid. Um, just make sure whatever you're choosing, don't just think, well, this says it does that. Have a look at their skin type always, always consider, I can't stress this enough, their barrier function. So is that impaired? If so, don't use acids straight away. Repair the barrier and you don't want to totally degradate uh, the surface of the skin because they'll be totally irritated, get more inflammation and get more pigment. Excellent, thank you. Sounds good. Um, we've also had a question from Heather who said, which vitamin C is the best and what concentration should a product contain? Vitamin C will be different from any different manufacturer. It's a very prickly ingredient. So if it's not encapsulated in normally like a sugar a glucose molecule, it will just lose on the surface of the skin, which is what you get a lot of over the counter. Professional grade products, uh, a lot tend to have 20% vitamin C, um, AA2G, uh, ascorbic acid can be labeled on the back of the product. I would speak to your manufacturer and find out exactly what vitamin C have you given me? How much is in here? And what's allowing it to come into the skin? So once it's in the area you need it, the um, glucose molecule around it will, will wear away and then vitamin C will work. You don't want it lost. It needs to be in a brown bottle as well. Excellent, thank you. And um, Fatima has asked, what about treatment for pigment around the mouth? So is there anything you have to consider? The um, if, the same as if it was anywhere else you would need to ensure they had a, a good, good sunblock. Um, you might want to give them stronger treatment if it's just in this area than the other area. And I like to use chemical peeling a lot for treating melasma. Uh, and if I get that odd sticky bit, I might do some microneedling as well. I do tend to stay away from lasers unless somebody had like a fractional laser. It's, they can be very different for the wavelengths that go through. So it doesn't matter where the melasma is, um, it's more how has it got there, what's the client doing and what would work best for this specific client. That's why I can't give you like a full protocol of do A, B, C because everybody's so different. Sure. So a very thorough consultation is the, is the key. You could change the pill. If, if, if the pill's caused it, they could speak to the doctor. Something, uh, Yasmin and Diana, um, I've had... Um, a lot of clients over the years and can uh, like pigment come up on the backs and things like that but they might be on it for a reason so they need to speak to the doctor great thank you and um, natalie has asked so if you have treated if you've pre-treated a skin type five or six for minimum four weeks and then start needling is the pigment likely to get worse before it gets better after the needling no um no it they you must, must be really, really careful with anybody over a Fitzpatrick 4 uh, because they, they'll ha have more um, of a different colour of melanin, which is darker. So pre-treat for as long as you can. 
monitor how it's going with the pre-treat. Is it starting to lighten? Is it looking a little bit better? Before you start needling, needle six to eight weeks apart, keeping the product routine that you've had going, going. Ensure that they're not doing... So you might have a Fitzpatrick six and she works in an office and that's all great, but you might have another Fitzpatrick six that does, I don't know, horse riding and it's outside all day. Is microneedling going to be the best sort of treatment for that? So take it case by case and you are going to monitor the wound healing afterwards. So you might need to uh, tweak your products to keep the inflammation down so that you don't get that elevation of melanin because it's there to, the melanin's coming to protect. Great, thank you. And um, another question is just put through from Katrine who said that was fantastic and a lot to take in, but I'll read I'll rewatch it so thank you oh, um, fast. <laughs> there is a lot to cover I think but that's why it's great so for anyone who is watching this will be available to watch back on our Facebook page afterwards so you can uh, have a little watch back and make notes and, and recap anything you missed um, but Katrina has asked I'm in my late 50s and only just started to get melasma but it's getting worse what would you recommend start to use um, it depending on your skin and how your skin type is um, I would start to use some glycolic acid wash if it's too sensitive for that use a nice gentle one in the morning a glycolic wash on an evening after you've taken all your makeup and dirt and debris away with the gentle wash then do um, a more intensive wash a product range I use has got a nice product which you can put on overnight and it's got lactic acid glycolic acid in you could maybe use that solidly every night as your night cream for a week um, so you want to be up in the alpha hydroxy acids to speed everything up, get the efficiency coming round, and then use in ingredients in with lightening. And if it's coming up in patches, I would maybe start to think about some glycolic peels, maybe not strong ones, but to control. You want to do them before it gets any warmer. I kind of quit with my clients. So my melasma clients will be maintained if we were in a normal world maintained from the end of March to beginning mid-September. Mid-September, I'd start to in, bring back the like microneedling treatments for pigment, the chemical peeling treatments for pigment. And then they'll be done in the winter because we're in the Northern Hemisphere, there's no daylight. So I kind of do that then and then bring back um, maintenance between, maintain them on their holidays because the heat brings it up and I just prepare them for that. Absolutely, thank you. And um, we've got another question from Tom. He said, is a picosecond alexandrite laser suitable for treating melasma? Yeah. Yes, I don't use it, but yes. Excellent. Um, another another um, practical question from Nikki. What are your thoughts on LED light therapy for melasma? Not um, something, I personally don't use LED. I have used it. And I, the only reason I don't really use it, I found my clients got a bit irritated under there and I was a bit irritated leaving in 15 minutes I would speak to whoever you got your machine from and ask for clinical studies and papers to show how it works on melasma because I would think for the depth of the nanometers that the light is going to probably not going to get much of a difference great thank you and another similar question from Katrina, would you recommend microdermabrasion to lighten the dark patches? No, it's epidermal issue, microdermabrasion is re removing the stratum corneum. So if you want to start to use it as a base treatment to help uh, remove the, ba the barrier and everything, then microdermabrasion, you can use it. You can use it on epidermal, but I, and it would help uh, with aging, but it's epidermal, you need dermal. You need something that's gonna get in to that dermal epidermal junction and start to work in those upper layers of the dermis and microdermabrasion just won't. Excellent. Okay, well, we are just about running out of time. So thanks everyone for watching and thank you so much, JD. I think um, in addition to questions, we've had tons of comments just saying this is really, really useful information and great training. So thanks. Well, it's hard to know if uh, you put it all together and everybody understands what I'm whittling on about. But <laughs> yes, um, it's been lovely to be back. Uh, we've all had some great news. Hopefully we get to stick to the dates. Um, and I know I'll see you again soon.
Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for joining and thank you, Jody. And we've got another upskill session coming up at one. So do join us for that if you can. Otherwise, we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.